اليوم احنا ان شاء الله تعالى راح نحكي عن الفراكشرز اند بون ديس اوردرز انا الدكتور محمد حمدان فروم فاكولتي اوف ميديسن اورثوبيدك سيرجن الصراحه هذا الموضوع جدا جدا كبير هو سواء الفراكشرز ولا البون ديس اوردرز سو اي ويل جو وذ ذا بيزكس ايشوز اوف ذيز ايشوز اوف ذيز توبكس اند وي ويل توك اباوت ذيم as much easy as possible. في البداية عشان نحكي عن الفراكشرز we should know what is the definition of the fracture and we can define the fracture as discontinuity or break in the bone. You can see here بتقدر تشوفوا البوينتر تبعي مش هيك هلا. You can see here that the cortices here are discontinuous and we have a break here in the bone. So this is the definition of a fracture in the bone. It's a discontinuity or break in the bone. And we can classify these fractures according to many systems, really. Uh, we can classify them according to the etiology of the fractures, the pattern, the uh, amount of energy, the relationship with the external environment. Um, we can um, 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 classify them according to the fracture displacement. And if these fractures are complete or incomplete, if they are intra-articular or extra-articular ones, so we have many systems to classify these fractures, but this system, everyone is unique because it, it helps a lot in the understanding and management of the fractures. We will see that while we are going. So if we choose to classify the fractures according to the etiology, um, we have three types of uh, fractures which are the first one is the traumatic one. Traumatic one for an example of it is, for example, to have a road traffic accident. In to have a road traffic accident. And in a traumatic uh, cause of a fracture, we have here in both limbs normal bone. It is a normal bone, totally normal bone. This normal bone, when, when it is exposed to normal forces, will not have a fracture. But if we have an abnormal excessive force, like the road traffic accident, we will have a fracture in the bone. And this is called a traumatic fracture. Why we said that? Because the other type, according to the etiology, is the pathological one. If we have this bone of normal bone and had a normal force, we will have no fracture. But if we have that bone in a pathological condition, had a pathological condition, either localized at the fracture site or diffuse, I mean generalized like osteoporosis, for example, and we have a normal force, I, I mean that bone is exposed to the normal force, we will have a fracture. What I mean, if I have a normal person who is walking and he fell down, he will have no fracture because he have an, a normal bone and he have a normal force. The bone is exposed to a normal force, which is falling from standing height. While the same patient, old patient, osteoporotic patient, while he's walking, slept down, he may have a fracture because we have a weak bone, pathological bone, that is exposed to a normal force, which is the falling down, but this, not, this force is not much excessive than the normal force, like in case of RTA in the previous example, which is the traumatic fracture. According to the etiology, also we have stress fractures. What we mean by stress fractures, it happens in soldiers. You know soldiers, it happens in the soldiers that the second metatarsal bone will be fractured. Why? Because we have a cyclical application of normal forces in excessive frequency to normal bone in a healthy patients or in a healthy people. So the patient, the people who are in the uh, in the army, and um, they have and they have a lot of marching. They may have end with a stress a fracture in their second metatarsal bone or the patients who had, you know, um, or the people who like to go hiking, for example, for a uh, long um, distance disease, they will also have uh, um, maybe have a March fracture. We call this a March fracture because it happens due to March. Also, another way to classify the fractures is the uh, displacement or the, the displacement. You can see here in the first figure that we have a non-displaced fracture. We have a bone, and in the bone we have a fracture here, but this fracture is not displaced. I mean, we have a normal alignment of that bone. While in the second photo here, we have a displacement 
we have a displacement, and this is called a displaced fracture. Both of them have different ways of treatment, really. I mean, the, the non-displaced one, I could treat it conservatively with no surgeries, while the displaced ones, most likely I will need to do surgery. And the displacement had many ways to describe. I mean, we can have a translation like this, we can have angulation like this, we can have shortening like this, if these two pieces of bone are distracted, we, we can have distraction, fracture distraction, and we may have rotation. Look here, if you look to the to the uh, femur bone, you can see here the condyles are just obvious and their direction here is just rotated. So we have a rotational um, uh, problem. So these, all of these can help me in the management in the future. I mean, the angulation I should get back the angulation, the, the translation, I should get back the translation, and shortening, I should lengthen the bone, and so on. So this classification helped me to do the reduction of the fracture. Also, another way to classify the fractures is its relation with the external environment. And this is very important in the management of a fracture. Look to the to the um, pictures here. You can see that the the fracture here is getting out of the skin. The skin is broken here, and the bone is getting out of the skin, and we call this open fracture. While in in the other one, the bone is not getting out either the soft tissue or the skin. Here, the bone is getting out of the soft tissue and the skin. Here, we don't have it getting out. So here, the bone is exposed to the external environment, and this means more infections more risk of infections, more risk of non-unions, okay? Um, uh, so the treatment of both these fractures, despite they are the same, they look the same, but because this open and that close is much different from each other. For example, in the open fracture, we need to give antibiotics. We need to give antitetanus, while in the closed one, we don't need to give antibiotics or antitetanus. Uh, here, we need to do irrigation. We need to do debridement of the wound, while in a closed one, we don't need to do is, uh, these issues. And that's why this is another way to classify fractures. Another way to classify fractures is also, is the quantum of force causing the fracture. And in this classification, we classify the fractures into two types. The first one is the low energy, low energy fracture, which has happened due to and uh, falling down, especially in elderly and osteoporotic patients, look to this. This is a low energy. It, uh, this lady is just walking. This, then she fell down. And this is a very simple low energy trauma. And it causes fracture, especially in the pathological bone, especially in the pathological bone, like the patients who had osteoporosis or tumors or tumors. While in the other photo or picture, we can see that we have a massive RTAs. I mean, look to the cars, how they are just deformed. And this is called a high energy trauma. This is called a high energy trauma. What is the difference between low energy and high energy? We should know that in patients who have a high energy trauma, we may have more sophisticated fractures. And even the fracture itself, it will be of less priority because we should take care of the life of the patients, then the limb of the patient, then the soft tissue, and at the end, the bone. So we should take care of, uh, we should take care of the life of the patient, and we should do, uh, we should apply something called advanced trauma life support before we are going to treat the fractures. Another way to classify the fractures is the complete versus incomplete. Look to this figure. I mean, here we can see a complete fracture, and here in the X-ray we can see a complete fracture. I mean, both cortices and both sides are broken, while here in the figure we can see that one cortex is broken, but the other one is not broken. And here in the X-ray you can see that this cortex is broken. You can see uh, a line here, but this cortex here is not broken. So the first one is a complete one, while the second one is an incomplete one. And both of them really, um, uh, for example, the incomplete fractures usually happened in the children and needs no treatment, except some back slab or some, um, some simple treatment. While the displaced ones and complete ones most likely happens in, in, in adults and needs really more aggressive treatment. 
Another way to classify these fractures is are they extra articular or intra articular? Because this is very important. Look to these fractures. These fractures is just out of the knee. I mean, these are extra articular. This is in the femur shaft. This is extra articular one. This is out of the knee here. This is all extra articular fractures. While these ones, this is the elbow, this is an elbow. We can have a line of fracture inside the joint here. We have a line of fracture inside the joint. Here, this is a femur, and we can see that the fracture is extending in the joint. This is intra-articular one, and the previous one is extra-articular one. Really, the principles of management of intra- and extra-articular fractures is just extremely different from each other. For example, in the intra-articular one, we should restore the joint anatomically exactly as what it is, while in the extra-articular fracture, we should restore something called functional reduction. We should restore just the length, the alignment, the rotation. You know, just only these things will suffer, will, will, will be sufficient to restore the, the function of the limb. So this is another way to classify the fractures. The last way to classify the fracture, um, um, and it's not the, uh, it, it really, it's one of the ways to classify the fracture, is the pattern of a fracture. And the pattern of fracture describe the line, how is the line of the fracture is coming. It's either symbol and or comminuted. And the symbol one, it could be transverse, oblique, butterfly, spiral, comminuted or segmental. The comminuted one could be comminuted or segmental one. The symbol one could be either one of these four. I mean, um, transverse, oblique, spiral, or even butterfly. And uh, why the fracture pattern is a way to classify fractures? Because it will tell us about the mechanism of injury, about the mechanism of injury. So if we have a transverse fracture, the force of a fracture that caused the fracture is a tension force. While if we have an oblique one, the, the force that caused the fracture is the compression one. While if we have a butterfly pattern like this, the force that causing the fracture is the um, uh, bending forces. And if we have a spiral fractures, it is a torsional force that will cause the, uh, the mechanism that will cause the fracture is a torsional force. I will give an example. Look, this is the knee. This is what is called the quadriceps muscle. This is the patella, and this is the patella tendon. And the quadriceps will pull the patella up if we have a tension from both sides, I mean, the quadriceps is just pulling up and the patella tendon is just resisting down, the, this, this will end with a tension force on the patella and we may end with a transverse patella refraction. And this is one of the examples of the tension force, how it will cause a, a transverse fracture. Look to this, for example. Here we have a butterfly fracture. And in this butterfly fracture, we can see a horizontal or a transverse um, uh, line, then an oblique lines. In the transverse line, we have a, a tension force here. So because of the bending from here and there, I will try to use some, some uh, pens. I mean here, here we may have uh, a bending here and the bending here, you know. So we will end at this side of tension at the fracture side. And here we, we will end with compression. Compression here and compression here. Especially if we have an axial load there, we will end with this butterfly segment. We will end with this butterfly segment. Look to this X-ray. We can see the butterfly segment here. And it is exactly really like a butterfly, and that's why they called it butterfly segment. And this butterfly segments have been due to a bending that will cause a tension force here and a compression force here, tension force here and compression force here with axial loading from above. This is an example of spiral fracture. Look to the fracture here. It is a spiral one, really. It is a spiral one, and this is happened due to rotation. I mean, the foot here is going just externally rotated, and the knee is going just internally rotated. And this will cause a spiral fracture in the bone. 
Now we finished the topic of fractures and we will speak about the bone bone uh, disorders or bone uh, problems. The bone disorders we have it is really it's a huge topic, but we have a two main bone disorders that affect the bone, which are the osteoporosis and the osteomalacia. We will speak about these two topics because they are of the most common topics that um, we are exposed to. Why the osteoporosis is important? Osteoporosis is important because we have around 200 million people worldwide having an osteoporosis. And um, we have around 1.5 million osteoporotic fractures occur each year in United States alone. So it is a big, it's a big a burden on the uh, countries. And what's the problem? If we have a fractures, we have a financial burden on the countries and we have a high mortality of, with the patients who have fractures. For example, the patients who have uh, osteoporotic hip fracture had a mortality of 20%. Well, the patient who have a vertebral um, fracture had a mortality of 15%, which is a very high mortality rate. Before we to speak about the osteoporosis, <clears throat> we want to speak about the bone. Really, the mature bone or the, um, the normal bone is divided into two main bones. The cortical one, which is um, uh, resides in the cortex here, and the trabecular one, which happens in the metaphyseal areas and inside the medullary canal. These two bones called lamellar bones. I mean, the lamellar bone had two types, the cortical one in the cortices of the bone and the trabecular one, which is, happens in the metaphyseal areas of the bone. And we want to review something uh, else, which is the composition of bone. The bone is composed of two uh, big components. The cellular component, which are the cells of osteoplast, osteoclast, and osteocyte, and the extracellular matrix, which is composed of organic and inorganic matrix. The organic matrix is composed of collagen, type 1. Remember that bone, the last three uh, letters is 1, so the collagen uh, in the bone is type 1, and in organic, in organic matrix, which is the calcium hydroxyapatite. The calcium hydroxyapatite is a crystal-like material that will resist the compression forces in the bone. Here, the cells, I mean the cellular component, this is the osteoplast will build the bone, the osteoclast will resorb the bone, and osteocyte really, it, it helps in the communication between the uh, cells. Um, the, in extracellular matrix, as we said, the organic matrix is mainly composed of collagen type 1, and the inorganic one is composed of calcium hydroxyapatite. You can see here, the, this is the microscopic composition um, uh, of the bone, which is composed of these fibrils, which is the collagen fibers and between these collagen fibers you can see here uh, the crystals i mean the hydroxyapatite calcium hydroxyapatite is just deposited so this is composing the extracellular matrix and how the bone is happened the osteoplast will put the uh, organic matrix which is called the osteoid i mean the collagen here and then the body will absorb calcium and phosphorus in, in, in a certain proportions and these calcium and phosphorus combined with each other and just they precipitate between these collagen fibers to do a mineralized matrix which has happened in the black here. You can see it in the black. So this one is the organic and mineralized matrix and this one is the mineralized matrix. I mean it has a collagen and um, the crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite. So osteoporosis, what do we mean by osteoporosis? The WHO defined osteoporosis as um, having two arms. First, it's, it's from the name. Osteo, it means bone. Porosis, it means a lot of pores, I mean um, uh, openings. So this is the osteoporosis. It's a bone full of uh, pores, okay? And um, uh, the WHO had two components to define this osteoporosis, which is first that we should have a low bone mass, and then second to have a microarchitectural deterioration. What do we mean by that? Look to this bone. This one is a trabecular bone. As we said, the lamellar bone is composed of cortical and trabecular one. This one is trabecular bone. Look to the trabeculae, how much they are um, wide, connected. And look to this bone. I mean, we have the same size, 
But if we weigh the both cubes, definitely cube number one will be heavier than cube number three. And so this means that in cube number three, we have a decrease in low, oh, I mean, we have decreased bone density. And it, it, is, it, it is weighing lesser than the cube one. And this is one of the definitions really of uh, osteoporosis. And look also to the trabeculae, they became thin. The connection is lesser and lesser. And this is what we mean by osteoporosis. We have two things. We decrease, we have decrease in the bone mass density because it has the same size, but with less weight. And we have a microarchitectural changes, which is the trabeculae that becoming thinner and less connected. Again, the composition, the microscopic composition of the uh, cortical bone here is different than the trabecular bone here. Look here, the cortical bone, we have these circles, which are the stones, and inside them is the Haversian canal. And look here in the osteoporotic bone, we have that Haversian canal is just getting larger and the stones are, the circles are become lesser. And even the thickness, the whole thickness the whole thickness of um, the cortical bone here is just decreased here. Look to this, it's decreased, much decreased. So we have decrease in two components. First, we have decrease in bone mass density because the thickness is decreased. Then we have a microarchitectural changes, which is enlargement of a Ferrishan canal and decrease on the circuits of the osteoporosis. And Again, if we have a CT for that, look to the cortex, how much it is wide here, and the width is here, and in osteoporotic patient, that width is decreased. And what does that mean? It means that the, the mass decreased, and also we have a microarchitectural changes. And what is the clinical application of that? It means that if I have a fracture in that bone and I want to fix it with a screw, the screw is just like that you put a screw in the eggshell, it will not catch. The screw will get out of uh, this bone and the fixation will fail and the patient will be uh, back again to be fractured and back again to the problems. This is the cancellous bone or trabecular bone. We can we we discussed that the density is decreased and you know the trabeculae is just becoming thinner and less connected. What are, are about the um, types of osteoporosis? Really, the types of osteoporosis are two major types: the primary and secondary one. The secondary had a definitive cause also, uh, always, I mean, like having a medication like a, a chemotherapeutic medications or antiepileptic medications or anticoagulation medication, hyperparathyroidism, excess uh, alcohol, smoking. So if we know the cause of osteoporosis, we can modify it. But really most of the patients with osteoporosis are of the primary type. So the primary type is the most important one. And the primary type is divided into two types, type one and type two. Type one is the postmenopausal one, which is the most famous type of uh, osteoporosis. I mean, if somebody asks you about the osteoporosis, you should bear in mind just uh, the, the type one of primary osteoporosis, which is the postmenopausal osteoporosis. In, in, in the next six years of osteoporosis, Many females really had um, uh, osteoporosis, and this is due to decrease in the estrogen um, uh, of their uh, body. And we have also uh, in the primary osteoporosis a senile osteoporosis, and this is happened due to uh, decreased absorption of um, uh, minerals from the uh, from the intestine. This is because of decrease in the production of vitamin D3 and uh, decrease in the bone formation. The osteoporosis causing the fractures and the most common site of a fractures in osteoporosis is the vertebral body. Then the hips, then the rest of fractures. And we should know every disease has a risk factors really. And what are the risk factors of osteoporosis? I'm always uh, holding, in my, uh, holding in my mind this lady. I mean, it's um, how to say a white, old lady with fair hair, freckle in the skins, had a lazy lifestyle, uh, alcoholic, smoker, Caucasian, 
uh, had a rheumatological disorder on steroids. I mean, these all cause are risk factors for osteoporosis. In addition to that, we, if we have a malabsorption uh, syndromes uh, like celiac disease, for example, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, cancers, all of these will cause also osteoporosis because it will affect the absorption of calcium and phosphorus. The patient of osteoporosis really usually is asymptomatic one. It, he has or she has no symptoms, except if she had a fracture. And the same for physical examination, we find nothing. How to diagnose a patient with osteoporosis? Really, we do something called DEXA scan. I mean, DEXA is, is abbreviation for dual energy X-ray absorbimetry. And in DEXA scan, we just take an images for the most two sites that are affected with osteoporosis, which are the spine and the hips. And we have numbers from these um, uh, photos, and we compare these numbers with the females of 25 years old age. If we have, if we com compare the bone mass density of an old one to bone mass density of a 25 year old female patient, we will have a number which is called T-score. If we have that T-score more than minus 2.5, I mean like minus three or minus uh, 3.5, if it is have, if we have that number more than minus 2.5 or equal to, it means that this lady or gentleman had um, uh, had an osteoporosis. And this is how DEXA scan will help us. Um, this is, um, um, uh, this is, this is just for brainstorming how to treat osteoporosis. Really, we have um, a bone signaling cycle. And in this bone signaling cycle, we should know that the osteoclasts are just doing this bone resorption. And most of the anti-osteoporotic medication, they just, how to say, they just uh, stop the osteoclast function. They try to uh, preclude the osteoclast class function, uh, either like bisphosphonates to destroy the um, these what's called ruffled um, borders, or, or to uh, inhibit the um, this uh, uh, this uh, cycle by binding to the rankle and preventing them to bind to these green things, which is uh, which are rank, which are the receptors that are responsible for activation of osteoclast. And how, what is the treatment of osteoporosis? It's lifestyle modification. For example, if our patient is alcoholic or smoker, we should advise him to, to stop smoking, to quit uh, smoking and to quit alcohol and, to, and stop um, alcohol. And uh, if, he, if he had a lazy lifestyle, we should in, in, uh, encourage him to have um, more um, exercises, really. And we can treat also the osteoporosis with um, uh, medications, like giving him calcium vitamins, I mean, the bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates is a big issue really here. It's one of the anti um, uh, treatment, uh, and it had um, a, a rare complication, which is joint necrosis. I never saw it in my life, but um, it is one of the nightmares of the dentists, really, because um, you should ask your patient about if he had if he is on uh, bisphosphonates, especially the IV one, because you should stop them before doing the teeth uh, of the patient. Otherwise, you may have this disastrous complication, which is a vascular necrosis of the jaw. Um, and the other medications, although denosumab also may have uh, this catastrophic really uh, complication. Denosumab is immunoglobulin, which is against uh, the um, against the uh, the rankle, and uh, this will prevent activation of osteoclast. The uh, last topic that we will speak about is osteomalacia. Really, there is um, um, uh, a difference between osteomalacia and osteoporosis. In osteoporosis, you can notice that everything is going down in the bone. I mean, the bone mass with its own component. While in osteomalacia, what we have, we have a problem in the mineralization of the bone only. And really, the osteomalacia had two names, osteomalacia or rickets. But osteomalacia is, is the name for the adults with the closed physis, and the rickets is the name for the children with open physis. But they are the two names for the same disease, but one is for adults and one for um, children. 
I will remind you with this uh, photo because the osteoplast giving the um, organic matrix, then we have mineralization with, for that organic matrix to be mineralized bone. The problem in the rickets is with this step only, I mean the calcium and phosphorus precipitation or um, um, uh, mineralization inside the bone. So we have collagen fibers and we have less crystals between these collagen fibers, I mean calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. On, on, um, on microscopy, what we can see that we can see if this green is the mineralized bone, we can see this red one. I mean, this, this is an organic matrix. The organic matrix had uh, another name, which is called osteoid. So we can see here that the osteoid is wide, and this is what is called in histopathology wide osteoid seams. And here the osteoid is seen, I mean, the, the osteoid seams is wide. It should be something small like this one. And this is what's called wide osteoid seams because we have less mineralized bone. We have less mineralized bone in these areas because of lack of calcium or phosphorus. So the problem really of uh, osteomalacia is that we have a problem in the calcium or phosphorus or both of them. And what will do absorption for calcium or phosphorus uh, or um, uh, bringing them to the blood is really vitamin D. And this is a very famous photo for vitamin D, how it has happened. I mean, vitamin D is just, we take it from the sun, the skin is exposed to the sun and it will cause uh, inactivated vitamin D3. Then it goes to the liver for 25 hydroxylation. And then it goes to the kidney for one alpha hydroxylation. And we will end with the active form, which is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. This is the active form. So it goes from the skin, then to the liver, then to the kidney to have an active vitamin D. Otherwise, the vitamin D will not be active one. And what's the end effect of vitamin D? It will increase the renal calcium absorption and it will increase the gut absorption of calcium and phosphorus. So it will increase both phosphorus and calcium. So if we ended with a problem with the vitamin D, we will end with decreasing calcium and phosphorus. The other issue is that parathyroid hormone had a feedback mechanisms with vitamin D, but the net effect of the parathyroid hormone that it will increase the calcium in the blood, but it will decrease the phosphorus or phosphate in the blood because it will, um, um, it will um, increase the renal excretion of phosphate. What are the risk factors for uh, osteomalacia? It's logical to have any problem with vitamin D, malabsorption. If we have a celiac disease, for example, we will not be able to absorb calcium or phosphorus. If we have a renal failure, renal failure will end with um, hyperparathyroidism and will uh, uh, increase the excretion of phosphorus. So will not be, there will not be an, uh, if a sufficient amount of phosphorus to combine with sufficient amount of calcium to do mineralization. Hypophosphatemia, uh, this is um, a problem in the kidneys that will decrease the phosphate um, reabsorption. So we will end with uh, increased excretion of phosphate in the urine. Chronic alcoholism, this will affect the um, absorption. A tumors, it will um, secrete a material called phosphatonin that will increase the excretion of phosphate and we will not end uh, with sufficient amount of phosphate to bind with calcium to do mineralization. Many drugs also will affect the uh, calcium and phosph phosphate um, uh, absorption like uh, antiepileptic, infinitoins, glucocorticoids, or steroids, chemotherapeutic agents can and can to affect uh, had issue. Um, is the osteomalacia symptomatic disease? Yes, osteomalacia is not like uh, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is not symptomatic, but osteomalacia is symptomatic one, and it will end with generalized bone aches, fractures of long bone. A proximal muscle weakness because it will affect calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, and this will cause fatigue. So the patient will have a difficulty to raise from his chair, or, or he will have a waddling gait, really, uh, because of proximal muscle weakness. What do we mean the by osteomalacia uh, in practice? From practical point of view, it means that calcium and phosphorus is much lesser in the bone. The mineralization of bone is much lesser, so the bone is soft. So with compression, we will end with bowing of the bone. We will end with the fractures. 
we will end with compression on the vertebra here. Look to the vertebra. It looks here small one because it is compressed from above and from below. This is. We will end that the head is just going inside the pelvis, and this is called a protrusio acetabulum. And these are um, uh, these are the meaning of somalacia that the bone is soft and under compression it will be deformed. I mean, how <coughs> how we diagnose also the osteomalacia other than the X-ray by using bone scan? Look here that in the bone scan we have hot lesions. And after treatment, these hot lesions are just faded. So this is the this is also one of the ways to diagnose really um, uh, osteomalacia. And how to treat osteomalacia? We treat it by giving more supplements of vitamin D and calcium and phosphorus. And if we, if we have, for example, a hepatic problem, we should give 25 hydroxy vitamin D inside the body, and then it will go to the kidney and do active 125 hydroxy vitamin D. But if we have a renal problem, we will use uh, how to say we will use um, uh, uh, the active form from the start because it will not be activated if the uh, renal problem is there. And uh, and this table is a good table really comparing the osteoporosis and osteomalacia. Here in osteoporosis, we know that everything is going down. While in osteomalacia, we have a problem in the unmineralized bone. Osteoporosis really most of the time is coming in the old of the patients, old age patients. Why osteomalacia is coming at any age. And we said that if it happens in children, we would call it rickets. Um, uh, the etiology, we said this, so process had the primary and secondary one, while the osteomalacia usually had a secondary cause, no primary causes. I mean, we should check for the cause of the uh, osteomalacia that will end with, at, at the end, will end with vitamin D deficiency or decrease in calcium and phosphorus. Osteoporosis is not symptomatic, except if there is a fracture, osteomalacia is symptomatic, and uh, the patient had generalized bone aches and proximal muscle weakness. Um, uh, this is also for the science. The in, in, in X rays or radiographs, the osteoporosis had the tendency for uh, axial bones, while the osteomalacia is going to the appendicular bones. Lapse of osteoporosis is normal, while in osteomalacia we will have something abnormal in the calcium or phosphorus or vitamin D. And uh, really, this is maybe the last slide of the presentation. I want to ask uh, if uh, if uh, anyone had any questions. Okay, if there is no questions, I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and you understand it. Allah to kul afi. Yeah, recording. I leave recording. I think, I think, I think, Doctor, and you have to um, end the recording, and then it will automatically save the chat, as far as I know.